And we continue in our studies in the book of uh, Galatians, entitled Galatians Made Alive. And we trust that thus far you have been able to join us and that you are benefiting from this epistle that was written by the Apostle Paul to the churches that were in the province of Galatia. We have seen not only what the gospel truly is at the beginning of chapter 1, We've also seen the need for a messenger who senses God's call and at the same time is one that has been confirmed by the people of God, especially bona fide leaders, to then take this message to those who need to hear it so that the borders of the kingdom of God may get wider and wider until our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, returns. We went on to see in the last session how justification, which is the heart of the Christian gospel, is one that we must emphasize, we must jealously guard, we must keep asserting despite the winds that might be blowing around of various doctrinal understandings, even within the Christian faith. And so we saw from chapter 2 of uh, Galatians, how the Apostle Paul was able to confront even Peter, a fellow apostle, saying you are being hypocritical in the way in which you are responding to the pressures from the Judaizers, the circumcision party, those that are trying to make Jews have a higher stake in the kingdom of God, and then the Gentiles to come into a secondary position. It says, no, we all come on our knees, we all come in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is by grace alone. We saw how the Apostle Paul argued for this, that both Jews and Greeks will come um, abandoning either self-righteousness or abandoning idolatry and simply embracing the cross of Christ. In fact, Paul used his own example towards the end of the section that we saw together. We saw in Galatians 2 verse 20 that wonderful text that I said in the last session, I wish all of us would be able to memorize when he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says there, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All oh, that each one of us would have that basic approach and basic understanding and commitment and love to this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which we are not only brought to a position where our records in heaven are cleaned, but we are also brought in a position where our hearts on earth are also cleaned, so that between the two, we are prepared for glory. Well, that's what we saw from Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, all the way to the end. We are entering into chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, and we will go only up to verse 22. Galatians 3 and verse 22. What is this passage talking about? Still continuing on the theme of justification by faith. But what the Apostle Paul is going on to argue is that in fact, that's how Abraham also was justified. In other words, when we come to God in Christ Jesus, in order for us to be justified by faith, we are being justified just like Abraham. Now for the Jews, that was crucial. It's where the argument stood because they knew that Abraham is our father. And therefore, if Abraham is going to enter heaven through another door, 
I'm not going to accept being taken in through a second door. Forget it. I must go the Abrahamic way. The Apostle Paul is arguing, saying, actually, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way through Moses, going on to David and Solomon and so on, all of them who find their way into heaven find their way through this one avenue, justification by faith only. Well, let's delve into Galatians chapter 3 in order for us to learn this most important lesson. And one reason why it is crucial is that there are no two sort of tires, two grades by which we get to heaven. You know, when you're in an aeroplane, um, although the aeroplane arrives at the same time, uh, you are often put into two categories. Uh, there is the, the first class, and then there is the economy class. And sometimes there's a further one, which is the, the business class, and so on. And in each one of these, the conditions you experience are different. And so it's very easy for us to fall into that mentality with respect to going to heaven. That, uh, you know, there are some who are in just economy class, somewhere at the back, you know, and we, we don't even bother about them. But there are others who are in, in first class. And these are the ones that we must really be concerned about because they're the ones who really matter. There is nothing like that with respect to reconciliation to God, with respect to going to heaven. There is only one way. There's only one class. There's only one tier. And it is justification by faith only through the grace of God. Well, what is the Apostle Paul teaching us in this passage of Scripture? First of all, it is this, that all the blessings that we receive in salvation come to us as a result of our faith in Christ. Let me say that again. All the blessings that ever come to us in this life or in the life to come, as children of God, they come to us completely, solely, by faith in Christ. We have trusted in Him. We have believed in Him. We leave the rest to Him. In fact, this was the one point that totally astonished the Apostle Paul when he looked at the Galatians because when he was among them, that's the one thing he taught, that everything hangs on the cross of Christ. How then do you start moving on to something else? How? Well, let's hear the Apostle speak for himself. In uh, the first nine verses of Galatians and chapter 3, Listen to this. Oh, foolish Galatians, he says, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That's a wonderful way of putting it. Pardon my taking a few breaks as we go through these nine verses, but I don't want us to miss the point that the Apostle Paul is bringing out. And in this particular case, the point is saying is that, you see, when I was in the province of Galatia, I was like a man who was holding up one big billboard or banner and it had Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. There was nothing else on that banner but Christ and him crucified. Wherever I went, that was my only message. Christ and him crucified. Christ and and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. Now, where on earth are you getting this other message from? Because I only gave you one message. It was as though it was on a big, huge billboard. Nobody could miss it. 
It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. So he goes on to ask them the question now. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things, in, if indeed in vain, if indeed it was in vain? He adds, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham, there it is, Abraham is coming in. As Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. What is he saying there? Fairly simply this. When you repented of your sin and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came to take residence in your soul. Did you have to add works? Did you have to, to do some dabracadabra, dabracadabra of one way or the other for the Holy Spirit to come and take residence in your soul? No. You repented, you believed in Christ, and Christ came to dwell in you by his Spirit. You simply believed in him. And even when the Apostle Paul was among them, because of being an apostle, he was enabled to do great miracles among them. He's again asking, what is it that God basically put in you that I would be able to do this among you? What is it? Simple. You believed. That's all. He believed. And by believing in Christ, even these supernatural wonders were done among you in a glorious way. So there it is again. All you did was to believe in Christ. He did the rest for you. But even this righteousness that he goes on to speak about with respect to Abraham, it was also through faith. We are told in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham was declared righteous not because he observed the law, as we shall see in a moment, but because he believed God. That's it. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So up to this point, we've seen the gift of the Holy Spirit, the enablement that came upon the Apostle Paul among them in terms of the miracles that he performed among them, in terms of the righteousness that Abraham received, which they have also received, again, exactly the same way. It is by trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished work. Let's go on, because he goes on to speak about the sonship that we have to Abraham, that it's also yet another blessing that has come by virtue of believing in Jesus Christ. Verse 7 to verse 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Wonderful. We are told there again in verse 7, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In other words, even sonship has come to you based purely on the fact that you trusted in Jesus Christ. 
his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God on high. All these things are yours. These blessings are yours because you have believed in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that today? Do you? Do you believe that today? You see, there are too many believers, especially young believers, who are set on a wild goose chase, running here and running there for all kinds of experiences, following different kinds of self-proclaimed preachers who are basically saying, I am the anointed one of God. You come to me and then I will do these things to you. And often they say, you do this and that. And one of them is money. They'll say, you sow the seed. You give me money. You put money into this fertile ground, which is my ministry. And then you will receive various blessings of God. Nonsense. What nonsense that is. And that, the, the unfortunate thing is that hundreds of thousands of people are chasing after all this. I, I want to say with the Apostle Paul, all foolish Galatians. Yes, it is utter foolishness. It's as though so many people have been bewitched. That's what Paul is saying here. Who has bewitched you? Because if you are truly a Christian, you don't need to start chasing after all kinds of people telling you that if you can only do this and that, some, some anointed water, some anointed oil, you know, you give me your money and let me first of all sleep with you. Yes, it's happening. These self-proclaimed prophets are sexually abusing females in the name of some blessing coming to them, all that would wake up. All the blessings we need are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. Ours is to believe in him, the crucified one, Christ crucified, Christ crucified. On this big billboard, Christ crucified, that's enough. That's enough. That way we get all the blessings of God. But let me hurry on because we've got quite somewhere to go. You see, attempting to keep the law results in being cursed because we cannot measure up to the standard of God. We cannot. But the good news is this. Christ redeems us from the curse of the law. Christ redeems us from the curse of the law. This is what the Apostle Paul goes on to assert from verse 10 on to verse 14, that Christ brings God's blessings to us. Prior to that, the law can only bring a curse. Do this and do that only brings us to the point of failure. Christ alone brings us the blessing. Let's quickly read verse 10 to verse 14, and I'll comment as we go along. But all who rely on works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. You see, what happened was before Moses uh, left, as he was sort of wrapping up, particularly the book of uh, Deuteronomy, what he did is he set before the children of Israel um, blessings and curses. And basically what he was saying to them after he finished remuner re 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 remunerating, no, no, remunerating to them the law in all its details, he sits before them and now says, if you obey the law 
fully, God is going to bless you. And here are the various blessings. And he lays them out, blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And then he says this, if you fail to obey the law, these are the curses that will come before you. And he lays them out, curse after curse after curse after curse. That's where the Apostle Paul is now going. And he's saying this to them, that cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. Let's face it, we've all failed. We've all failed. If we go that route, the way of the law, we have all failed. The curses that God has spoken about there, including the ultimate curse of us going to spend eternity in hell, that is already ours because we cannot in our own ability and strength gain the blessing of God. It's absolutely impossible. Well, let's read on because that's the bad news. Thankfully, there is good news. Verse 11. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. The point that is being made there is this, that that route is closed because we failed. Thankfully, there's another route. And it is the righteous living by faith. In other words, simply trusting in God, that God himself has dealt with this matter for me once and for all. How? The good news. The good news. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, not only to the Jews who were under the law, but to anybody, including the Gentile nations, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. What the Apostle Paul is saying is this, that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he took upon himself all our failures, all our sins, our inability to keep God's law, which has brought on us the curse. He took all that upon himself. And because he took all that upon himself, God could now send that entire curse, that thunderbolt that was supposed to sink us deeper than the grave into the flames of hell. He fired it upon his own son. And Jesus drank in that thunderbolt. He drank in that curse and expired. It's finished. It's done. The curse has been born by someone else, the Son of God, so that we could be redeemed. In other words, brought back now from the curse because God's righteousness has been satisfied. Jesus hanging on the cross has taken our curse by becoming a curse for us. So now we're free. The curse has been dealt with. What about the blessing that Jesus merited by his own righteous life? It's there, free. That blessing now becomes ours. The blessing of Abraham is now given to us freely because Jesus has paid 
the price for our sin. He has done it all. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what the joy of the Christian life is based on. It is this completely finished work of God's own Son upon the cross, taking away our curse and therefore freely giving us the various blessings of the Christian faith that we saw earlier on. God being our Father, giving us His Spirit, answering our prayers, in coming into our lives, even to do the supernatural, yes. Not because he's gifted us in that way, but as we are praying to him, crying to him, he is able to visit us in a miraculous way that even we cannot be able to explain. Not because we've put some kind of uh, money and, and uh, tithing into some ministry guys' hands. No! Nah! Simply because we've asked of him, he is our father. We are now sons of Abraham. We have been brought into that position. Indeed, the righteousness of God's own son is given to us. Everything is in Christ. All the blessings are in Christ Jesus. In him, all the promises of God are yea and amen. I wonder whether that's your understanding today. I wonder whether you as an individual are one who goes to God as a child of God in Christ alone asking him to receive you, to give you his blessings. In fact, many of the blessings are already packed up in his spirit who comes to dwell within you. I wonder whether that's your faith today. Or I wonder whether you're one who is running around, running around, following these individuals who are claiming that you do this and you do that. You give them your, your car, you, you give them your house, you give them your wife, you give them your daughter, you give them half your bank account. You do this and do this and do this and do this. That's when you are going to get the blessings of God. Are you a victim to all that? Are you? May God help you not to go that route. Finally, we need to see that our covenant inheritance is also only through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our covenant inheritance is only through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're wondering what I mean by covenant inheritance, don't worry. We are about to see that in verse 15 down to verse 22. Verse 15 down to verse 22. Uh, the Apostle Paul begins with a human example. And in beginning with a human example, it's because he wants us to understand this concept. It's a very simple concept. And the concept has to do with covenant. Covenant. Let's read this. He says, uh, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it, that is, cancels it, or adds to it once it has been ratified. In other words, when two people get together, they read the terms of the agreement on both sides, and finally, they, they sign on the dotted line this agreement. That's it. A person doesn't take that agreement on his own and begin changing its contents to satisfy him. No, 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 no. It's too late. The agreement was already made. And worse still, if somebody who has signed there says that when I die, these benefits are going to go to Tom, Dick, and Harry. And then that person has died. Finish. 
there is no reversing of it because that signature was done the person who signed is not there to change his mind it's all over that's the point he's making there and we'll soon apply it spiritually he says in verse 16 now the promises were made to abraham and to his offspring notice he does not say unto offsprings, referring to many, because that would mean that some of them are still alive and therefore they could make those changes, but referring to one and to your offspring. Who is that offspring? We are told in the text, who is Christ? In other words, the one to whom the promises were given Christ has come into this life, he has already put his signature to it, that those blessings are going to be ours. He has even died. In other words, he has sealed it with his own blood. It's over. So who is it who's going to change? How? Who is it who can now come and say, okay, these blessings which are supposed to go to this person because he trusted in Christ. No, no, no. We're going to change it now because, uh, you know, one or two things he did in his life, he didn't completely satisfy the law. He didn't do all these other details. Therefore, we must take it away from him. How? He who appended his signature has even died. He sealed it with his own blood. There is no reversing. If you are in Christ, then all the blessings of salvation are yours. Absolutely. There's no turning back. So he goes right back to Abraham. In the day of Abraham, when the promises were being made, it was to Abraham and to his offspring. To Abraham and to his seed. So let's go back to Abraham first of all and see when this promise was being given. When? The Bible goes on to say here, this is what it means. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, in other words, through Moses, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. You know, even in our country, it's probably the same in Kenya, in Uganda, in um, Rwanda, whatever other countries might be listening in here, Tanzania, maybe even Ethiopia. I'm sure some Zambians uh, sneaking in their ears and listening, whatever country you might be in, the point is this, that if you inherited something under a particular law, changes later cannot take that away from you. It can't, because at that point, when you were inheriting, that was the law that was there. The point is making is this, that at the point that these blessings were being offered to Abraham and to his offspring, it was by promise full stop. By promise full stop. Abraham simply believed and it was given to him. He believed and God said, here you are. 400 plus years later, that's when the law was added by Moses. That's when all those issues of blessing, 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 or cursing, cursing, cursing were being dealt with. That can't change the promise that was already in place to Abraham and to his offspring, to Abraham and to his seed. In other words, to his seed, Jesus Christ who being the eternal one, was already there. In fact, he was slain, as the Bible tells us, 
from before the foundation of the world. In the mind of God, it was as good as already done. All the Old Testament sacrifices that were taking place there long before the law was given, they were all but types of the sacrifice of God's own Son on the cross. In other words, as far as God was concerned, through Christ and through Christ alone, the promises, the covenanted inheritance, was to be given out to his people, those for whom he was to die. The law cannot change that. Then what does the law do? Oh, let's go on. Let's go on. When the law comes in, verse 19 downwards, why then the law? So there you are. Is that what you're thinking? Paul is already talking about it there. Why then the law? Listen to this. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. I think the point he's making there is quite simple, and he will come back to it uh, later on in chapter 4. And it is this, that because sin had entered into the world, what God did was to provide the law as a kind of schoolmaster, to provide the law as a kind of guardian. In other words, the, the children of Israel were being put together as a nation so that they could, as it were, carry God's self-revelation within a context of civil government, within a context of all the ceremonial laws and coupled in the midst of all that with the moral law. All that was being kept going generation after generation through the law of God, the Mosaic law. Because sin was in the world, transgression was in the world, and therefore God was preserving his self-revelation through this entire nation. That's why it was put there. That's why even angels functioned as intermediaries, we are told there, so that this would be preserved over period and period and period. But it was simply a temporal measure because ultimately God had something greater for all of us. Let's quickly read that in the remaining two verses. Verse 21 and verse 22. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. While sin was reigning, scripture put all those things together, kept them imprisoned, so that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. In other words, finally, with all this still happening, there was still God's righteousness in the midst of all this that was being given through his promise by faith in Jesus Christ to those who, would, who were true believers in him. And we shall come on to see all this, especially when we come into chapter 4, because the Apostle Paul will open all this up. He will show, for instance, that between Hagar and Sarah, the promises of God were through Sarah and her seed rather than through Hagar and her seed. And even when we come between the children of God, you've got um, um, Jacob on one hand whose name became Israel 
and uh, his, his, his own brother uh, Esau, again, it's fairly clear that God was continuing with the line of promise, continuing with, with the line of grace, continuing with those who were chosen from before the foundation of the world. So it didn't matter whether they were all somehow living in, in, in the same context. He had those that would then trust in him and in trusting in him were receiving his promise and consequently receiving his salvation. It's been exactly the same way. From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, later on among his children, the 12 tribes of Israel, not everyone became an inheritor of this spiritual promise. And even when we ended up with Moses and then the 12 tribes of Israel, and so forth. Again, they were individuals who were genuine believers and consequently were getting saved. And there were so many others who were simply coming along, following this imprisonment as it were, this custodianship that the law had provided as his truth was being carried generation after generation. The way of salvation is the same through Christ Jesus. So, and it is all the way from Abraham, all the way to today. In fact, you can even go backwards, but Abraham became the embodiment of the same way of salvation. And what is that? A righteousness that is by faith alone. That's what we have seen in today's message then. We've seen that we are justified like Abraham and that all the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus only come to us by grace and they only come to us as we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Abraham was justified. It was not through any kind of works that he was doing. No. We are told Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It is exactly the same with us. All the blessings of God in and through Abraham come to us in and through Jesus Christ, his seed. Have you believed in him? Have you? I want to say again, Stop chasing after do this and do this and do this. Then you will receive forgiveness from God. Then you will receive various blessings of God. Stop it. Trust. 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 All the blessings of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. If he doesn't bless you in a particular way that you prayed for, he's holding that back from you, but it will still be yours in glory, in heaven. Ultimately, that's where all the blessings of God will be experienced to an infinite degree. For now we rejoice in sins forgiven, we rejoice in being clothed in Christ's righteousness. We rejoice in the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in us. We rejoice in being adopted as God's children. We rejoice in all these things. Now, are you rejoicing in them? Are you? Or are you a person who's thinking that, uh, no, you, you must become the richest person in your town? the richest person in your country. That's the blessing you're looking for. Those blessings, even the non-Christians have them and they perish with them. It's the blessings promised to Abraham of reconciliation with God, of being justified by faith, by Christ, through his blood shed on the cross, 
such blessings are the ones we have received and consequently we enjoy his presence even now in the midst of all the trials of life we enjoy his blessings we are able to say in the words of romans 8 28 for we know that in all things god works for the good of those who love him who are the called according to his purpose these promises of god that in all things he's working for our ultimate good for our eternal good i want to ask are you trusting in christ alone for this knowing that all the blessings that were in abraham's porch are also yours in christ because you are justified as he was justified amen